quotes Infused with the scent of potpourri Films we commit to memory Crossing the felt ropes Watching from home on my TV Looking at all my eyes can see Tell me I view obsessively. Hello and welcome to The Obsessive Viewer, where a weekly podcast that reviews one or two new release titles every episode with an occasional free-for-all segment at the end that we call Potpourri. You can find more of our work, including written reviews, full episode show notes, and the complete backlog of our episodes at obsessiveviewer.com. You can also write into the show by emailing me at matt at obsessiveviewer.com. And if you'd like to support us and get access to hundreds of exclusive episodes, you can join our Patreon at Patreon patreon.com slash obsessive viewer where you can get access to content at any of our tier levels as i put a pillow behind my back uh, for comfort <laughs> any of our tier le- levels on a recurring monthly subscription basis or you can buy individual collections a la carte in the patreon shop section um, this week on patreon i've just released some early access to uh, anthology episodes um, i'm getting back to doing more patreon stuff i've just been very busy so i apologize for that but anyway uh, you can get access to uh, tons of stuff on Patreon, uh, aside from the stuff I haven't released in the last week, um, at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and you can find me on social media, including Letterboxd at obsessive viewer. And in my feature review this week, I'll be reviewing Dev Patel's directorial debut, Monkey Man, which opened in theaters on April 5th. And for my secondary review this week, I'm going to review the documentary Girl State, which was released on Apple TV Plus on April 5th as well. And as I have been doing intermittently here and there, um, uh, I've been uh, doing uh, live streams and video content on the YouTube channel for Obsessive Viewer uh, Obsessive Viewer Podcasts. Uh, right now, I believe I only have one person in the chat. So hi, Paige. Thank you for joining. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit it's a little bit nerve wracking to, to do that like live stream thing. So anyway, it's there. And then I'm going to have video content on the uh, YouTube channel uh later so this is an interesting episode because i'm doing a solo episode of obsessive viewer and um this is actually the day before the episode is going to post so usually i give myself a couple of days cut some some leeway um but i kind of push the recording to uh to the day before so so yeah that's a little behind the scenes i've had a very busy week in terms of (laughs) podcast related stuff and it's been kind of great it's been kind of amazing so like monday i recorded a um the secondary review for next week's episode of Obsessive Viewer. So Mike and I re- reviewed uh, Late Night with the Devil. And then yesterday I recorded an episode of Anthology for Anthology <laughs> with my friend Victor. Uh, we're gonna That's going to go up on Friday. It's on Patreon now. And then right now, Wednesday, I'm recording this episode. And then tomorrow night, I'm recording next week's um, Anthology episode with Tiny. So it's a, it's a very stacked week. It's very, very stacked um, and busy. So, um, uh, so yeah, so I haven't hit the wall yet, but, uh, rest assured it's coming. So, uh, so yeah, so as is customary, this episode is going to basically take the, uh, take the structure of me doing uh, news items and news and, and, uh, little bits of information from the entertainment world, uh, before getting into the featured review, the featured review, as I said, is going to be for Monkey Man, Dev Patel's directorial debut. And that's going to take the form of a non-spoiler review followed by a spoiler review. And then I'm going to wrap up with a non-spoiler section secondary review of Girl State. So having said all of that, let me go ahead and let my voice crack on the mic once again and go into news uh, before the reviews. So uh, so I've got a few news items here that I kind of want to run down a little bit and share my thoughts on. Um, they're a varying interest level for me. Um, so the first one I have is that Kevin Smith um, his next movie is, uh, is a movie called the 430 movie. It is, uh, was just picked up by Saban, uh, films. And here's the thing. So, so here's the thing. My understanding is that Kevin Smith bought the movie theater that he grew up going to, um, all the time. And he has basically made a film 
set in the, I think, 70s or I think it's the 80s. Um, it sounds like a slacker hangout movie, um, but he has set it in that time frame at that theater. And let me just read from Deadline. So uh, it says, set in the summer of 1986, the coming of, the coming of age comedy follows three 16-year-old friends who spend their Saturday sneaking into movies at the local multiplex. But when one of the guys also invites the girl of his dreams to see the latest comedy, each of the teens will learn something serious about life and love before the credits roll. And here's the thing. I do not believe... I, I'm and I'm willing to be proven wrong on this, but I do not believe Kevin Smith has it in him to do another good movie. Like I have fallen off of Kevin Smith as a filmmaker steadily since since really Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Really, Tusk was the start of that, but Tusk, and then from there, I I never saw Yoga Hosers, but uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot was very not good and. Um, and so that was, that was very much not good. And then Clerks 3 happened and Clerks 3 was a travesty for me. I just hated that movie with such a burning passion and it's enough to make me just write off Kevin Smith. Like, I don't think that I am really in, in the camp of Kevin Smith being being uh, making anything more that would be interesting to me um and i know that that's probably a little bit of a of a crappy position to be in regarding a filmmaker that i actually really like a lot of his movies but that's just how bad clerks 3 was for me and this movie the 430 movie is a little bit in defiance of that in my head because on paper, this is the type of movie that I adore. I love coming of age movies, especially a movie centered around like movies and movie going and movie theaters, the nostalgia of that. All of that sounds right up my alley. I just don't have faith in Kevin Smith anymore. <laughs> like I really don't. It's that, that's how bad his, his, his trajectory, his, his filmmaking has gotten for me. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I will reserve judgment, of course, but I'll also, um, it'll be an uphill battle. But the movie also has, in the cast, it has uh, Ken Jeong, Sam Richardson, who I love, uh, Genesis Rodriguez, uh, Justin Long, Jason Lee, Rachel Drash, Kate Micucci, um, Adam Pally, uh, Harley Quinn Smith, and Method Man. Um, so I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. I don't know. I don't know exactly when it's supposed to come out. I just know that it was bought uh, by uh, Saban Films, and uh, I don't know. It doesn't say like when it, uh, if it has any uh, leads on when it will be kind of brought out. But that's the 4:30 movie, and. <laughs> Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm sure I'll talk about it in some capacity, either on the podcast or on Patreon at some point when it comes out. Um, so that's one news item that I have. And the second one is a more, a much more exciting one. It's, uh, Tim Robinson and Zach Kanan, who they are the creative force behind, I think you should leave, which is one of my favorite like comedy anythings. It is, it is, it's a sketch comedy show on Netflix. It is 100% my type of humor, 100% just what I love about comedy. And Tim Robinson is the center of it and he's, he's phenomenal. Um, so there, the news broke on April 2nd that, uh, Tim Robinson and Zach Kanan, uh, the, they have a comedy called the chair company, uh, that got an HBO pilot order, uh, with Adam McKay producing Adam McKay. I'm a little, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, the, the summary of it, the, the details of it are that, uh, is that, uh, the chair company written and executive produced, produced by Tim Robinson and Zach Kanan. Uh, it follows after an embarrassing in incident at work, a man finds himself investigating a far reaching conspiracy. So, it's a comedy, and from the sound of it, it sounds like it's going to take. It sounds like it'll take a bit of um, 
a bit of a nod from I think you should leave like this the plot summary of it sounds very much like and I think you should leave sketch like there are sketches in I think you should leave that sound exactly like this type of of uh sketch like this type of storyline I'm thinking in particular like the whoopee cushion one which is an all-timer favorite sketch of mine where he sits down on a chair in a meeting at work and someone has a whoopee cushion on it and he takes it literally or he tries to just understand what the joke is. And it's just, it's that brand of comedy. Like, I hope that this has that same type of energy in that it's the kind of the kind of through line of I think you should leave for the most part is someone experiencing something and not letting it go or experiencing something and f- carrying it to the like extreme of um, cringe comedy. And I hope that the chair company follows suit in this. Um, I don't know. Like, here's the thing. So. So Tim Robinson is going to play the the main character, the the man who finds himself investigating a far-reaching conspiracy. And it's he can do either way. Like he can do either either way. He could do like the heightened like crazy um uh character who is taking things too seriously or taking things too silly um like at any end of the spectrum or he can play the straight man in this with everyone else being crazy and and comedy leaning um so i don't know uh it, it could go either way and i'd be i'm very happy with either way um uh yeah so and it also says that uh the pickup Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, to half hour starring. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's all that it says about that. So, um, don't know when that'll come out, but I'll put a link in the show notes. Of course, uh, very excited for this because I really like Tim Robinson's brand of comedy. And in fact, I think you should leave went on tour and I'm so mad that it didn't come to Indianapolis. Like I would 100% have gone to, um, to like, I think you should leave the like stage, whatever the, um, uh, the live performance of it. I saw some TikToks of it from Detroit and like, it just looks fun. It looks like fun. And like I said, I think you should leave as one of my favorite comedy, anythings. And I think it would have been just really great to see it, but unfortunately they didn't come to Indianapolis. Um, unrelated to any of that, it, someone that is coming to Indianapolis in August is comedy bang bang. And I want to, I really want to try to go to that. Um, I don't know how much tickets are. I think the pre-sale is like this week or something, but I don't know how much it is, but I'm, I want to actively look into that, um, because, uh, cause I would love to see comedy bang bang live. Um, the next piece of news that I have is, uh, from bloody disgusting. The headline is new matrix movie in the works from the cabin in the woods director, Drew, Drew Goddard. Um, I haven't read much about this, but, I I don't know. <laughs> like I, the Matrix Resurrections came out in uh in in 2020 2021 late 2021 and it was fine. It was interesting, but I don't know like it didn't really grab me. It didn't really it didn't really satisfy me in terms of like any any type of like concluding chapter of that, of that franchise, or it didn't excite me for future installments. It was just mediocre. It was just kind of middle of the road. I did appreciate that. I think was it Lana Wachowski? Um, uh, or it might've been, I can't remember which one directed it. I think it was Lana, but anyway, um, I did like the kind of trans allegory for uh, in matrix resurrections, how it is kind of a, an interesting inverse of, of, um, of, of the kind of the one arc for Neo and how it's kind of the, it's shifted over to, to Trinity for Matrix Resurrections. I liked that about it, but this, I don't know. <laughs> like, I like Drew Goddard as, as a filmmaker. I love The Cabin in the Woods and uh, he's written some things that I really liked. I think he wrote the first Cloverfield movie. Uh, yeah, he wrote Cl- uh, Cloverfield. And I think that he is, he is a good person to be to be given the keys to the matrix, I would say specifically because he is comfortable wading into those genre bending, uh, sort of spaces. So like Cloverfield was like a monster kaiju movie, 
but found footage and and had some interesting stories storytelling in uh, in that regard. And then of course, Cabin in the Woods is. I mean, that's, that's as much genre bending as you can get. Like that is like, that is a horror satire, but played straight. And, um, it encompasses so many different elements of horror in a, in a horror comedy kind of, uh, kind of space too. So I don't know. Oh, he also, he also worked on Daredevil, which, uh, I think it was yesterday. It was the like nine year anniversary of the premiere of Daredevil on Netflix. But anyway, um, yeah, I don't know what this fifth uh, Matrix movie is going to be like or w- what the plan is. I don't know if it's going to be like a single installment with the intention of maybe doing um uh further installments after that if it's if it's um successful. But I don't know. I I just I don't know. The statement in the article says um and this is from I think this is from Okay, so so Lana Wachowski will be on board as executive producers. That that makes me feel a little bit better about it. But uh, the quote from uh, Warner Brothers, uh, Warner Brothers Pictures president of production Jesse Ehrman uh, said, "Drew came to Warner Brothers with a new idea that we all believe would be an incredible way to continue the Matrix world by both honoring what Lana and Lily b- began over 25 years ago and offering a unique perspective based on his own love of the series and characters." Uh, the entire team at Warner Brothers Discovery is thrilled for Drew to be making his, this new Matrix film, adding his vision to the cinematic canon The Wachowskis spent a quarter of a century building here at the studio. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> that's really interesting that it, they're at least presenting it as Drew Goddard coming to Warner Brothers with an idea. Like, this... I don't know, I don't know how, like, honest that is, like, I don't know how truthful that is, because so much of the Matrix Resurrections was built around kind of creating this identity or this idea of Warner Brothers trying to cash in on the Matrix franchise, so I don't know if this is, like, this is, this is a statement that's crafted by design to, to kind of take us away from that, uh, from that idea, but I don't know, that, that does kind of make me feel a little bit, um, a little bit better about it, that it is something that Drew Goddard, uh, had like in his mind and his statement, uh, regarding it is quote, it is not hyper hyperbole to say the matrix films changed both cinema and my life. Uh, Lana and Lily's exquisite artistry inspires me on a daily basis. And I am beyond grateful for the chance to tell stories in their world. Um, so we'll see what happens. That's the new matrix movie is, is in the works. We'll see. We'll see what happens. And uh, the final piece of news that I have is yesterday, I think it was yesterday, yeah, um, the trailer, the first trailer for Joker, Folly Adu, uh, was released, and I don't have it queued up or anything uh, to play on the live stream or, or in the recording or anything, so I apologize for that, but I'll just talk briefly about it. Um, I liked Joker. I liked Joker when it came out in, like, what, 2019, I think? Um, I enjoyed it more than I expected to. The attitude and the, um, the conversations surrounding it were really not to my liking. <laughs> like, I think it's one of those things that, um, certain, certain like chodes, um, <laughs> of people online, uh, kind of took, took it by the reins and just kind of became un- un- insufferable about it. Um, but aside from that, outside of the response to it, the reaction to it and the kind of trolly nature of it, I did think that Joker was solid. I do not think it was Academy Award worthy solid like by any stretch, but I do, I do think that it was an interesting bend on, on Batman lore, I guess like that. I don't know. It's hard to say because Joker is such a weird character. He's such a character that demands ambiguity and Joker just kind of flies in the face of that, um, in a big way, but I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little bit back and forth on Joker, the first movie. Um, but the trailer for this one, um, I will say that my interest in Joker Folia do is very small. I, I am not that interested in it. Um, it's going to be a jukebox musical with Lady Gaga playing, um, uh, Harley Quinn, which that's somewhat interesting, I guess, but 
uh, I don't know. The trailer just kind of seems a little bit. It it didn't do much for me, and there's a lot of people like online saying like, "Oh my god, the the end scene of the trailer where she paints a smiley face on it, and then the camera positions it so that he's smiling on the other side of the glass." It's like that's not like like my thing is that it just kind of lingered on that a little too much, and it was like it was like Todd Phillips trying to be clever, but it's not a very clever shot by any stretch. But uh, but I don't know so. I did have this idea about Jokey, Jokey, uh, Joker Folia do that. I think I, the more I think about it, the more I think that if it went this, this route, I think I would be a little bit more interested in it, but basically like, and, and uh, before I say what my theory is or what, what my hope for Joker two is, let me just say that this is a very rudimentary, um, idea of what, the movie could be. Um, and I'll get back to that later when I say it. So basically my thought is it would be sort of interesting if Joker Folly Adu took the structure of the first like two thirds of the movie. Like let's say it's a two hour movie. Say the first, let's, let's say the first half, the first half of the movie would be interesting if it is this jukebox musical where Joker and Harley meet in an Arkham Asylum and then they break out and they go on this this crazy, vibrant, like silly crime spree through Gotham that's all presented through this jukebox musical. Um, and then at the halfway point or at the like at the at the end of the like second act, it would be interesting if the movie drops that completely and either either just shows that like, oh, that whole thing was in Joker's mind, like in Arthur's mind, a figment of his imagination, or that his imagining of it was the jukebox musical. So, and then the last like third or half of the movie would take the would take a more gritty, like realistic view of it. So my my imagine my imagining of Joker Folly I do is that a large portion of it would be this weird, whimsical, goofy, jukebox musical, heightened reality, um, crime spree thing of two just complete, in, completely insane, crazy, unstable people falling in love through this jukebox musical, and then it drops that and becomes this incredibly like violent and sadistic like realistic depiction of the violence that they're doing i think like i keep thinking about that and on one hand i'm like that would be really interesting that would be a really interesting way to do it a really interesting way to to uh to do a a joker sequel and to position it like that that would be really interesting and my other thing is, I feel like Todd Phillips is just dumb enough to do that. Like, like I feel like it's not that clever because my dumbass thought of it. Um, so, like, I think it would be neat, but I also think that that's, like, bare minimum in terms of what the structure of a Joker sequel would be. Um, but, but, yeah, so that's my kind of thought on it. I think it, I think it's still set to come out in October. We'll see, but the trailer's out there and yeah, that's Joker Folly Adieu. Um, yeah. And that is all the news that I have, uh, for this, uh, for this section of the episode. Now, let me go ahead and go right in to, um, uh, my featured review for the evening, which is for Dev Patel's directorial debut, Monkey Man. So as is, uh, as is, as is the case, I'm going to do a non-spoiler review followed by a spoiler review. Once I go into spoilers, I'm going to, uh, play a clip from the trailer. And once that plays, we'll go into spoilers. So let me go ahead and go into my non-spoiler review for Monkey Man. And to bring me into that, I'm going to read the plot summary courtesy of IMDb. Uh, Monkey Man, by the way, is in theaters now. Uh, It was uh, released in theaters April 4th. 
fourth or fifth. I don't remember what I said. April 5th, last last week. My voice keeps cracking. But anyway, um, so the premise, according to IMDb, is an anonymous young man unleashes a campaign of vengeance against the corrupt leaders who, who murdered his mother and continue to systemically victimize the poor and powerless. Uh, the movie is directed by Dev Patel, as I've said. Uh, writers were Paul uh, Eng. Gunawala and John Colley with a story by credit by Dev Patel. The cast includes Dev Patel, Charlotte Copley, uh, Pitobash, uh, Vipin Sharma, and Sikander Kerr. Uh, and I saw this in theaters. I saw it in Dolby Theater. Yeah, in, in Dolby. And I was pretty excited about it just because I really like and respect Dev Patel as a performer. Uh, in particular, I loved his performance in The Green Knight. He was also in that movie in 2016, Lion, which I thought was incredibly moving and a great exercise of like a a star vehicle for him in particular like his performance in that movie is so moving and and incredible in terms of the drama he plays a uh, a man who is i think i can't remember he's like displaced from his home as a child and he's adopted by uh australian parents and then it's about him in his adulthood trying to find his birth parents and it's incredibly moving it's beautiful uh, really fantastic. So those are kind of the two big performances in his career as of late that I find really, really like stand out. The Green Knight and Lion are two uh, very good performances from him. So the idea of him doing a an action movie as his directorial debut definitely had me intrigued. I didn't know much of anything about the actual plot before I went into it. And uh, yeah. So in fact, like the plot summary that I read, uh, from IMDb gives, gives a lot of detail in terms of, uh, his motivations, because like it says, an anonymous young, young man unleashes a campaign of vengeance against the corrupt leaders who murdered his mother. Like that element of the plot is something that isn't really explicitly shown or stated in the movie until probably about the halfway point. Um, not, I mean, it's very clear that that's, that his, that, that, that that's his motivation and that's what he's, what he's doing, all the things that he does in service of and in vengeance of, but we don't get the details of that until late in the movie. And I found that pretty interesting, um, interesting in, in bordering on frustrating because he does something, the movie does something that is kind of ballsy in that it takes this um it takes this backstory and conceals it from us it takes it takes the backstory keeps it from us and then goes about uh taking us on a ride through his experience of doing this vengeance plot without giving us the context of why he's doing it or what he's what has happened that spurred him toward uh toward doing this this big vengeance thing uh, going on this big, this big violent, uh, uh, thing. So what it, like what I, uh, why I say that that's a ballsy choice from him is that it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that is, uh, that, it, that is giving us the expectation or is, is done with the expectation that we will be, uh, on board with what's going on. And that we will like it will hold our attention. And for the most part, it definitely does hold our attention. Like there are sequences early in this movie where we know that he's plotting things. We know that he's doing he's orchestrating things to try to get into a certain position so that he can exact his revenge. Um, that buildup is basically like the first act or maybe the first like 45 minutes of the movie. And it's it's really solid. It's really interesting. And the way that he tells the story is really engaging because with that absence of of backstory, um, we he needs to make it interesting visually and and interesting through dialogue uh, to bring us to the point where we care about him exacting his vengeance and doing his doing his whole vengeance thing. Um, and he does a really good job of that through, through two avenues. One is he keeps it, um, mysterious while giving us a little bit of hints here and there. We get flashes of, 
of the big thing that happened that spurred everything the like we get flashes and details like we see like yeah his hands are very badly burned we see just just flashes of images of of blood and fire and a bunch a bunch of stuff without the context of it and in addition to that we also are guided through the story by like these very intense uh and in kinetic fight sequences where um he's 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 uh, credited as the character's cr- credited as uh, being named kid he's just referred to as kid so i'm just going to call dev patel's character kid but we get like very brutal sequences where kid is fighting in a like an underground boxing match or or a uh, ufc style like fight uh fight club thing and we eventually learn like he's doing that to earn money and to to kind of make it to get to a point where he can exact his revenge and everything so these sequences of just brutal fight sequences and uh and violence are kind of on one hand they're one of the standouts of the movie i enjoyed this aspect of it at least at the front of the movie uh there's like one whole sequence where there's a big a big sequence like that, a big fight club sequence like that toward the end of the movie that I just kind of felt like, okay, I understand why you're doing this in the story, but the storyline has advanced far enough to where I don't need this. Like now I don't need, like we've had a bunch of other, uh, action set pieces. And then now we're back to the, to the underground fight club thing. And it just felt very, uh, very bloated, like it bloated out the runtime a little bit or bloated out the movie a little bit and detracted from the main storyline. But I'll get to that later, probably in the spoiler section. So, um, the, but this, the beginning of the movie with this underground fight club thing is really interestingly done because it, first of all, you have from the trailer, like the, the monkey mask that he wears, it's very aesthetically speaking, it's pretty cool and interesting. And he just gets this shit pummeled out of him. Like he gets completely just decimated. He gets his ass kicked through it. And, um, and that's really interesting because it really showcases all like the, like it is a very violent depiction of, of, of him getting his ass kicked. It's not like a, it's not even like an underdog story where he's like getting his ass kicked and then like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get the upper hand or this is, this is my motivation to try to do something, uh, to help, to, to help people or to get the upper hand in my own scheming and everything. It's just him getting his ass kicked. And, it's bloody, it's vicious, and the way that it's filmed, and the way that other sequences in the mo- in the movie are filmed, uh, and action set pieces are filmed, it has this energy to it, this kinetic, like the camera movement is so uh, kind of kind of frenetic and crazy. <laughs> like it's it's not disorienting. It's it's done with such a a measured hand that's surprising, especially from a first time filmmaker to, to kind of storyboard this and, and to do the shots of this way, but it's very chaotic and very, uh, crazy. It's, it's really well done and it really brought me into it. And then that's a good way to be, to, to have like a sample of the action up front with this underground fight club, uh, aspect of the story. When the movie advances, like there's a whole thing where he gets in with um, an upscale uh, kind of clubs, a high rise club um, thing where he's kind of infiltrating it to get uh, to rub elbows with the rich and powerful among uh, like uh, his community. Um, he infiltrates that, but then once the action like kicks off from there in terms of him exacting his uh, his plot to, for vengeance, uh, and everything that is where like that, that kinetic and chaotic energy of the underground fight club sequences is repurposed for just like a vicious brawl and, and vicious like execution of, um, of vengeance. Like it involves like a gun and, and fight sequence. Like there's a big like set piece in a bathroom, Um, and what I love about that is that it isn't afraid to show things going horribly wrong. (laughs) And like, it's really, it's, I was very satisfied with the way that the movie transitioned from that, like coming up, coming up into, uh, infiltrating the kind of upper crust of society in order to get in, in the same room as the person who 
did something horrible to your family so that you could take them out. Like that is very satisfying. That whole trajectory is very satisfying. But then when you have the execution of the vengeance plot, um, it's really interesting because he's, it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of, uh, the movie Blue Ruin, which I haven't seen in like over 10 years, I think. But um, in that movie, that movie is kind of a similar sort of vibe where it's a man who's trying to do a vengeance plot, trying to seek revenge against uh, someone that did something horrible to his family. But he is so, um, he's not trained to do this kind of thing. It's like a bumbling sort of thing, but not in a comedic way. It's more of a like stumbling through a not, a, 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 a plan that's thought out well enough, but not executed by someone who is, I wouldn't say capable of, of exacting the plot, but is not properly trained to do so. And that's the similar kind of thing with Monkey Man is that kid played by Dave, Dev, Dave, Jesus, not Dave Patel, Dev Patel, uh, played by him. He is someone who has has devoted all of his energy toward getting into a position to to avenge his family and to and to um, seek revenge. When the time comes, it's not that he is ill equipped to do it, but he has that consciousness that that conscience seep into him where he he's it's a good plan, but he's he he is a human being who is maybe not fully equipped emotionally to do it. So. Uh, that is all like the first half of the movie from there we get, like, I haven't even touched on, um, the uh, socio political implications of the movie, which I'm a little bit hesitant to talk about because I don't know, like it's, it's set in like in, in India and there is this whole, this, this whole subplot involving, I think they're called the sovereign party, which I, I legitimately don't know if it's like it's a political party that's seeking power in India. And I literally don't know if that's a, like a real life one or an analog for a real life one. But it is unfortunately very much a um, something that is that that can definitely be um, uh, kind of kind of um, you can kind of put different things into perspective with it. It's basically the uh, it's an oppressive regime that is gaining power in, in the movie and, uh, political power to, to the point where they are, uh, displacing and maiming and murdering, uh, marginalized individuals. And, um, I'm going to dance around this a little bit because it is a non-spoiler section of the review, but I'll try to talk a little bit more clearly about it in spoilers. But the long and short of it is that once kid gets into a position where he needs to kind of seek exile in a sense. Um, he's taken in by a group of, uh, people that if they're not all trans people, there's a, there's a, a good portion of them are trans. I don't know. I don't remember if it's, if they're all like a, a trans, uh, uh, transgender community or it's just marginalized people with like the leader being a transgendered, uh, person. But either way, it is a group of marginalized people, which is so, it's it really hits home that that uh, the subject of like oppressed people over to overcoming their oppression and and fighting back like that is kind of a big theme of the movie and in the clip from the trailer that I'm going to play when I go into spoilers um you'll hear Dev Patel's character talk about how he wants to fight for people that are marginalized and and people who are being hurt by people um and that's a pretty that's a that's a noble thing that's something that I am all for in this movie but I do feel like it's a little bit um not underused but it's a little bit it takes a little bit to get going or a little bit to get to that point of the theme specifically because we have that build up of kid working his way up to try to exact his revenge and then only then do we get introduced to like the marginalized people of the community who are in hiding because their their lives are being threatened. And I kind of wish that there was a little bit more emphasis on that and on the sovereign party that is kind of the the kind of central villain or the central um uh cloud of villain throughout the throughout the movie. Um, I wish that that was a little bit more prominent in the build up toward like the second half of the movie where kid is taken in by them and is basically healed. It, it, it is, it is, is healed by them and built up by them. Um, 
yeah, I'm I'm still trying to dance around spoilers a little bit, but I I will say that as much as I am very much uh, pleased with that part of the plot and in the trajectory of the plot as well, I do have to admit that it is it feels a little bit um, I don't I don't know if I'd go so far as to say. Um, that it's, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that it's like, re, not reductive, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Derivative. Um, but it is a kind of, it is it is a it is a plot that we see a lot in movies, just like the, the bare bones of the plot, like a person that's trying to do vengeance and then does not succeed at vengeance and then has to recalibrate and then go after to do vengeance. Um, that is, that is on, like the skeletons of this movie are, it is is something that we've seen a lot in action movies. What sets it apart for sure is a that kinetic and chaotic camera movements and the way that the action is visualized. Also the setting, the setting being set in India, like in terms of seeing like seeing the uh not only like the criminal underworld of of the setting um i think i think the city is called like yatana i think i i i really wish i would have written that down but um but like seeing the the way that it depicts um both like the elite of that city and the just like the underworld the criminal element of it the criminal underworld of it it is so clean the way that it's done because it's it kind of reminds me a little bit of a, a bit of a more subtle thing than um what was done in Snowpiercer and Bong Jun Ho's Snowpiercer because throughout his journey kid goes through so many different ordeals and so many different different uh interactions that he is basically bearing witness to different different parts of society in in his community so like he's dealing with the upper echelon like rubbing elbows with the people that are um that are basically you know the the most successful and and rich and uh uh, terrible human beings, um, while also working in the kitchen and being, uh, being, uh, offered drugs and, and being, uh, being basically befriending people in the kitchen. And then from that, like through circumstances, he like, he stumbles into like a, um, uh, kind of a, uh, I don't know, like a, like a bordello, I guess would be the word for it. <laughs> like, uh, a, a sex building. Um, and, and like, it's just, it's the movie, it, the movie takes us through this journey that shows so many different facets of the community and, and the different, like the highs and lows of, of community, uh, of the community, the, like I said, the upper echelon, the rich, the powerful and the subjugated, as well as the criminal element un, uh, underneath all of it. And what I appreciate about that is, it, is it isn't as, straightforward as it is in Snowpiercer because Snowpiercer it's literally they're going through different trains of the uh, different different cars in the train and each each car is a different like level of society like it's not as clear cut as that but what I like is that that flow of it in in Monkey Man is it just goes through uh, it, it paints a vivid picture throughout the entire runtime as kid is going through these experiences and 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 everything um, and so I don't know how much more I have to say in non-spoilers for Monkey Man, but, um, I think the resolution, the kind of final act of the movie is pretty solid. Um, there's some elements of it that didn't really work for me because I feel like the, the person, I don't know, I guess, I guess the big finale of it, I feel like could have been, I, I, I wouldn't say could, could have been, but. I feel like I would have I would have enjoyed it more if it was more prominent in terms of uh, action and resolving the story. Because once we get to the kind of end game of it, um, it seems like it, it runs it falls a little bit flat. But um, despite that, though, the the kind of depiction and the reveal of like what happened in his past to spur him toward this vengeance. Uh, uh, is really solid, is really solid and, and satisfying. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword there. Um, 
Yeah, and I think that that's it for the non-spoiler portion of this review. Um, overall, I did, I I really did like Monkey Man. Um, not quite as much as I would have uh, as I would have hoped to. I ended up rating it uh, three stars on Letterboxd. I wrote just real quick in the in the Letterboxd review. I wrote uh, the raw action and bloody violence show some promise for Dev Patel as a director. There are some interesting set pieces where the camera moves in a really free flowing, chaotic way. While the scene as a whole is kept coherent and energetic, but the story itself isn't as engaging or unique, and the middle portion of the story really needed more time to develop. And I stand by that, and especially with his kind of entrance into the community, the underground community that takes after him, I would have liked I would have liked to have more time spent with them and more time spent developing that culture, that side of the story. Um, because it is kind of, it is very important to the story, absolutely important, but it also kind of feels like it's, it's, it's pushed it, it by necessity of the plot and everything else going on. It's kind of pushed to the background a little bit too, too quickly. Um, and so when it, when it resolves itself itself, it, it doesn't have that, that much, as much of an impact as it, as it should have or could have. Um, so yeah, so that's my way of dancing around my feelings toward uh, Monkey Man. That's my non-spoiler review. I'm going to go ahead and go into spoilers for Monkey Man. So if you haven't seen the movie and you don't want to be spoiled, uh, go ahead and stop listening and or watching or whatever. Go see the movie and then come back and, and listen to this. If you're uh, listening to this in the episode once it posts and everything, thank you. And also uh, check the show notes for timestamps to navigate away from spoilers for monkey man um and if you're watching the video that i'm going to post of this uh later uh scrub through it i guess or i don't know who knows but anyway um i'm going to go into spoilers for monkey man so i'm going to do that by playing a clip from the trailer and when i come back i'm going to be spoiling monkey man city the rich don't see us as people give me the job no one wants to do i'll do it Anyone who forgets their place, it doesn't turn out well for them. This is not the place to work if you can't handle that sort of stuff. Every day, I've prayed for a way to protect the weak. I've got an answer to every prayer. I call her Nikki. Minaj! Big bumper? Nice headlights. Let's boogie! All right, so spoilers on for Monkey Man. I'm going to be spoiling the movie now, so... um Please don't listen if you don't want to be spoiled. But uh, one thing I want to talk about, first of all, in the spoiler section that um, I didn't really touch on in the non-spoiler section was, and I don't know his character's name. <laughs> I feel terrible for that. But uh, the character who is kind of his friend, who is kind of who kind of befriends um, Kid early in the movie, the one that has the little cart that's that he calls Nicki Minaj. Um, I feel like that that character had a lot more potential to be a lot more fun. Um, like I think it's presented, he's presented as a character who is, um, supposed to be the comic relief, but it's really only in like one section that he does anything kind of humorous. And I don't need it to be a cookie cutter kind of comic relief story or, or comic relief character or anything. I just want more consistency. And I feel like that character, um, I think it was Alfonso. Um, that character isn't developed enough. And because he's not developed enough, um, I feel like what little comic relief we have just kind of sticks out a little bit. It sticks out a little bit and makes it a little bit uh, a little bit disjointed for me. But that's a minor quibble with it. Um, in terms of spoilers, the action in this movie is pretty fantastic. Like, pretty fantastic. I had seen some people talk about how it's Dev Patel trying to make like a John Wick movie. And it's not like John Wick is on another level in terms of action, like in, in fighting and everything like they're It's, it, they're not really comparable because John Wick is, is huge. It's a big, big thing. <laughs> and it, having said that they do name check John Wick a little bit. Like they reference John Wick when he's buying the gun. Um, 
but it's its own thing. The vengeance plot in this movie, like, let me talk about that. Let me, let me refocus a little bit and talk about the vengeance plot because I do appreciate the storytelling in this movie in, in the regard that it's, that it conceals the, the, the grand, the grand nature of the vengeance, I guess, or I don't know if that's really the right way to say it, but, um, it conceals the thing that causes him to go on this, go on this vengeance kick. And I really like that specifically because it's told very smartly in the sense that we don't know the extent to which he has been hurt and his family has been hurt. We can infer from context in, in the movie that his mother was killed in some capacity. We see these flashes here and there of, blood the the river and his hands burned um and we see flashes of his mother as well and we, when he uh says to to the guy he says something something like blessings from my mother as he's about to pull the trigger um we can infer from that that like okay yes this man is responsible for killing his mother um what I like about that is that that's all we get until like the midway point or when he's kind of convalescing with the, with the underground community. Um, until then we don't know the extent of what he's planning for his vengeance or exactly what he's planning to do with that. And I think that that makes his, the botched, uh, vengeance that he does all the more thrilling because we don't know the full extent of why he's doing this or what's causing him to do this. And because of that, it's so much more thrilling and interesting and engaging than if we had been, uh, given like a more linear plot that just shows like, Oh, Hey, you know, uh, he killed his mom and now he's seeking vengeance. It's, it's a lot more than that. And I do give the movie a lot of credit for, for holding that back and keeping our attention as the audience, um, to, to kind of bring us into the fold once he's been beaten all to hell and is like near death. I really, really like that. Um, having said that, that convalescing sequence where he's, where he's, um, being healed and he's, he's working back up to be, you know, his full, uh, full power, full extent and training back up and everything. I like that in theory. I like that in theory. I, on paper, I like that as as being an extension of him being someone who is um, needs to be built up before he can do it. Like it's basically his entire um, his his entire method of exacting his revenge and his entire plan is something that he's done in solitude and it's something that he's done on his own and it's not until he he makes contact with those people and is healed by them and trained by them that he's able to be like the the monkey man he's able to be the person who who brings justice to everyone and helps bring justice uh uh to everything like that's what I was kind of getting at when saying that this is sort of a pretty standard sort of um, storyline, um, even if it is for like dumbass American audiences like myself uh, in a setting and in a culture that I'm that I'm not familiar with. Um, it's still it's still a pretty straightforward narrative um, and a pretty straightforward narrative structure. And I do think that it's commendable to Dev Patel that he's able to take something that is pretty conventional and create something that is as uniquely filmed and uniquely photographed and un uniquely told as well as it can be, um, in this, in this iteration of the movie, in this, in this version of the movie. So I do commend him for that, but I do also think that when we are brought into that underground community, that the, um, the displaced community of, of trans people, uh, who are under like they're being systemically eradicated basically from the sovereign party or by the sovereign party. Um, I, I just wish that so like, there's so much in that middle section that is devoted to kid kind of growing back, like, like getting back to a hundred percent and having that kind of underdog story where he's just like, he's been beaten near to death and now he needs to build up. It's that training montage thing in every Rocky movie, but it's in this movie. Um, so because of that, 
because it's focused so much on him and him being built up, I feel like the stuff that with the sovereign party and with the trans community and with the marginalized people, the the horrors that are facing um the people in in India in this movie, in this in this community. I feel like that's that takes a little bit too much of a backseat or a little bit too much, not enough emphasis. And I wanted more of that. I wanted more of that. I wanted to know more about the characters of the people who rescued him because like we, we get we get a, a decent amount of stuff with them. We do like I, they're not they're not two dimensional characters by any stretch. However, when they come to his rescue at the end of the movie, when they when they are, you know, helping him like when when they come to his rescue and then allow allow him to go after the main bad guy, um I wanted to feel more connected to them because it, like they looked really cool. It was very cool to see them like like dressed up and ready for battle and everything. But it also just felt like, okay, I know the main person, but I there's not really, there's not much character to anyone else in that group. It's just like, they're all like one big collective. Um, and like, I get the main point of that. Like, I understand that as a collective, they are a marginalized group that have been very much taken, taken down by this government entity, this by, by the people in power. And that's what's causing them to come to his aid and to fight alongside him. And that's great. That's awesome. I just wish that there was a little bit more detail about like those individual characters, those individual uh, people in that group. And I think that because the movie puts so much emphasis on kids um, build up, build back up to being a hundred percent and being in a position to really, uh, to really fight and, and, and get the upper hand on the people that uh, are responsible for the horrors of, of the, the people that he cares about are facing. Um, because there's so much emphasis to that, I feel like the absence of, uh, the absence or, or limited, uh, limited, um, experience of building up the other characters is a little bit noticeable. And the other thing is that late, late in the movie that, um, him in the underground fight, after he is like, he is the monkey man. He is, he's able to kick ass and he's able to just completely demolish people. Um, that's what all well and good. Like that's okay. But I also feel like it was a little bit, I don't want to say it was unnecessary because it is pretty necessary for the arc of the character to, and it. And again, it goes back to it being kind of a, the skeleton of this movie being a pretty straightforward, um, kind of, underdog, uh, upper hand person fighting back against systemic issues, uh, with violence and everything. Like it is a, it is a pretty standard or, uh, commonly made movie. Um, I commonly made movie. That's, that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit too, too harsh, but, um, it is a movie like it is a movie that in its skeleton is, is, has been done before in several ways. Um, so I understand structurally why we need that demonstration of kid getting back in the ring and being able to just completely demolish his opponents in the underground fight club thing. But it also felt very like in light of the characters, the underground characters, not being that well, um, drawn in terms of, uh, get, having any type of dimension or anything. Um, in light of that, I felt like that scene of him, of the new and improved kid fighting in the, in the ring was kind of unnecessary. And it just didn't really work for me as, as the stepping stone toward him finally going after the people that are, that are in charge and the people that are, uh, that are, uh, subjugating and, and murdering people. Um, so that, that was something that just structurally didn't work for me. Um, the reveal or the final, finally revealing what, uh, what he went through and what his mother went through, um, and, and what spurred his whole experience of, of going after the guy for, for vengeance and revenge. That was really good. That was really haunting and 
sad. It was very, very sad and, uh, and, and depressing really. So that's really all I have to say about, about that. Um, yeah. And then I guess kind of the final thing about this, um, cause I don't really have much else to say in spoilers. Um, well, let me, let me, before I get to the final thought on that, cause I kind of want to talk about the big bad at the end of the movie. Um, but before I get to that, that botched vengeance plot, um, that is 100% the standout of the movie for me. Like him, uh, him trying to kill the guy in the bathroom and then getting his ass kicked and it leading to that just like run through the city of like an escape plan, an improvised escape plan was so cool. Like that was 100% the standout of the movie was him trying to escape from that and it even has like a little bit of that comic relief where he is like he sees the window and he's about to jump through it and then he just tries to jump through it but it's a window it's not a it's not an action movie like it just doesn't break uh so he has to improvise from there like little bits and pieces like that i kind of wish that there was a little bit more of that in the movie but uh but i do like the way that that like i don't know that whole sequence really really worked for me even with the bigger issues I had with the movie. So like I said, that kind of lack of consistent comic relief through the movie. And also, uh, the character that joins him, uh, his friend, God, I just had his name. I think it was Alfonso. Um, his character like that. I'm pretty sure that was him, but, um, but like, when he joins him, like when he, when he, when he tells him to get in the car, when he commandeers Nicki Minaj, the car, uh, and they're running through the, or they're driving through the city in a high speed chase and everything. All I kept thinking was like, why is he joining him? Like, why, like, why, why is he part of this? Like, what, what is it about him that makes him part of it other than just needing it for the action of the moment? Um, maybe I missed something as to why he would be, um, kind of tagging along aside from it being his car. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. It just, it just didn't really mesh well with me there. Um, again, the camera work in terms of that sequence was really cool. I really like how it went into that POV shot after, after he crashes and you get like just the weight and severity of, uh, him losing conscious, like slowly losing consciousness and you get like that tension through there. It felt like a little bit like a video game cutscene, but in a good way. Um, and then, uh, oh, I also wanted to talk about the ax sequence, um, where he has the fight in the brothel. That's the word I was looking for. Um, the brothel, I think with the, with the guy with the ax and, I had just I had just assumed that the axe was going to be used to break his handcuffs and I think that that was intentional to to uh be about like what what it was going to be um but I like that they subverted that and I like that they um that they didn't go that route I thought I thought that was pretty clever um you also get that moment where he sees the little girl under the bed and he tells her to run um as he's like bloody and and disgusting because of <laughs> because of the fight um, I liked that too, as another indication of the, the kind of the darkness and, and depravity of the, the underworld that he's kind of drifted into in his, uh, in his vengeance plan. Uh, so I like that. So, um, to kind of wrap up the spoiler review of, uh, monkey man, I do think that the kind of the, the big bad, the final kind of encounter with the head of the sovereign party. Um, I don't remember his name. I think it was, uh, is it Baba Shakti? Um, that was a little bit underwhelming, I guess. Like for me, it felt like he, so, so that section of the plot, the whole sovereign party, the party in power that is going after trans people and people that are different, like the subjugating and murdering and, and all of these horrible things. That is something that is, I feel like it was a little bit inadequately built up because it is present throughout the beginning of the movie, um, through like little vignettes that we get just on TV, like little bits and pieces. And there's a little bit of dialogue here and there talking about him specifically that's laying the groundwork for 
uh, for depicting it to be this bigger issue that that Dev Patel's character is going to uh, suddenly find himself uh, involved in. Um, and I, on the surface, that's a good way to do that. That's a good way to build that up. But I think that because they held back uh, Dev Patel's character's uh, backstory and his mother's backstory, because they held that back, those little bits and pieces of the main guy uh, on TV just didn't really land all that well or didn't really build up all that well toward the big finale of him being like the big bad of it or or what have you. So I don't know, but I did like that final confrontation. Just visually, it was interesting because he's in like a long hallway at like the top of a skyscraper. And it's just a very big, um, a very, a very big kind of showcase of his power he's like alone he's like washing his feet and and he's like he's in control of that um even with the sound of the helicopter and him saying like oh my chariot awaits or whatever it's just like he's in such a position of power there that even then he knows that he's you know he's in charge and and what have you like that's that's kind of standard fare a little bit but it's also pretty well done well pretty well drawn as well so uh, i did like that final kind of uh encounter with him even though it is kind of i don't know the overall ending kind of just was okay it was very it was it was mildly satisfactory i guess would be the way that i would describe it um i don't know it, overall it was it was a decent movie i do think that as a directorial debut, I think that it's very, um, it's very solid and it makes me very, uh, eager to see what Dev Patel does next as a, as a director, uh, which is something I always say. I feel like that might be a little bit of a cop out of, of a wrap up thing. Whenever I talk about it, like, Oh, this, this person whose work I respect has gone into another medium. Um, so I'll like, yeah, the movie is, is fine, but I'm excited to see what he does next. Like, that's something I kind of feel like I say a lot, but I do genuinely think it'll be interesting to see what Dev Patel does next. I don't know if he'll stay in action or if he'll do something else, um, do, do something else because I think that he has such an eclectic, uh, such an, such an eclectic, uh, filmography in terms of, a uh, of his, uh, performing as an, as an actor that I think that he can do a lot. Like he can, like, I feel like there's potential for him to do a lot in a lot of different genres as a director. Um, I don't know if he'll be just sitting at like action stuff or anything. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. So anyway, that is my spoiler review. That is my full review of monkey man. It is in theaters now. Uh, it was in theaters April 5th and it is in theaters now. And, uh, now we're going to go into my secondary review, but before I do that, I do just want to take a quick moment and, uh, just want to give you guys a quick reminder that if you like the show, uh, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review it on whatever app you use and share our episodes on social media whenever they post and, and everything. Uh, just share it around, give it a repost, give it a like Facebook post or whatever. Um, and yeah, just help get the word out on the, on the show. And in addition to that, I don't have it in my notes here, but in addition to that, I do have, um, a thing where if you are interested in starting your own podcasts and you want to find the best way to do that, go to Libsyn.com and, uh, sign up on Libsyn to host the podcast there. That's where I've hosted all three of my podcasts for a decade now. It's a great, like, I would like, I would not shill for them or be an affiliate for them if I didn't wholeheartedly love their product because I've been using it for, uh, nearly a quarter of my life at this point, maybe over a quarter of my life. I don't know math. Anyway, uh, lipson.com, uh, go there. And, uh, if you are starting a podcast, sign up there, use the promo code obsess or the link in the show notes of this episode, which, uh, are available at obsessiveviewer.com slash zero or so Jesus obsessiveviewer.com slash OV four, two, three. So that's all I've got for that. Now on to the secondary review. I'm going to do a non-spoiler review for Girls State. And to bring us into that, I'm going to play a little stinger here and then a clip from the trailer for Girls State. They tell me I view obsessively. In 2040, I intend to run for president. So I think Girls State, I'm going to run for governor. Attorney General. Supreme Court Justice. 
Okay. okay. We're never gonna get the opportunity to talk to people from different parts of Missouri the way that we are right now. I am a very social person. I will talk to a wall. All women women. All right. So, Girl State, uh, it is available to stream on Apple TV Plus. It was at Sundance and bought by Apple TV Plus, um, and it was released on Apple TV Plus on April fifth. Um, Directors for this documentary were Amanda McBain and Jesse Moss. The plot summary is, it follows uh, 500 adolescent girls from all across Missouri as they come together for a week-long immersion in a sophisticated democratic laboratory uh, where they organize a Supreme Court to consider the most contentious issues of the day. So I was extremely excited for this movie. Um, Extremely excited because in 2020... These same directors, these same filmmakers uh, came out with Boy State, which was a documentary about the same thing, like the same, I think it's like the American Legion uh, puts it on, Um, but they basically do this concentrated week long, uh, kind of like a United, like Mock UN or or whatever it's called, like uh, uh, Jesus, a fake government thing, a mock government thing. but they basically do that for a week. And in 2020, they had a documentary called Boy State, which was the boy side of it. Um, and even then, I remember thinking like, oh, that'd be really great because they, if they did like an additional documentary about the girl side of it, because there is a girl state uh, program as well. And as luck would have it, they had the same idea and <laughs> they did it. And um I I did mean to rewatch Boy State, which is also available on Apple TV Plus, um, but I didn't get a chance to rewatch it. But I do remember just adoring that documentary, and it came out at a time where, obviously, it was twenty twenty, very different time, and very contentious time with uh, in terms of politics, and the uh the kind of level of politics uh that were kind of all across the world <laughs> or all across the country so it was a very contentious time but what i found so interesting about that documentary was that as jaded and cynical as i have become about like modern politics and us politics and uh and and People like, I don't know, people that have viewpoints that are opposing to mine, like it it has become so much more contentious over the years, even since 2020, um, that it's, it's something that I just, I try not to participate in or be conscious of because I know my, my ideals, my, my values, all of these things. And I try not to judge too many people for their, uh, beliefs on, or their ideals and everything, unless they, you know, go to the fucking Capitol on January 6th, whatever, but they're anyway. So that all that's to say that in 2020 boy state stood out as a really interesting view of like high school kids, like 17 year old kids putting together like a mock government in a week time and taking it so seriously and exploring their viewpoints, their positions, their, like their, the way that they can just dive into politics. And what was surprising to me about Boy State was that it made me feel hopeful for the future. Like there are kids who take it so incredibly seriously. And yes, that documentary became kind of contentious with some of the subjects and some of the, some of the subjects of the documentary. But at its heart, I thought like, man, this is, this is a, this is a depiction of thousands of kids who are passionate about government. And like, just like, there's a little bit of a glimmer of hope in that, that makes me excited for future generations. And maybe not, I don't know if I'm ready to be excited about the future of the comp uh, of the company of the country, but it is something that gives a glimmer of hope. Having said that, that preamble brings me to Girl State, which came out obviously this year, 2024. Um, and I kind of have the same thought. Like I have the same idea that, in fact, like on Letterboxd, I, d- I don't have it in front of me, but on Letterboxd, I said something to the effect of, if these filmmakers want to make a documentary about kids 
it, kids' experience with mock governments in in uh, their political ideals and and how they how they uh, socialize among other politically minded people. Um, if they want to do this every four years, have at them. Like I would love to see a sim- like a them make this same type of documentary once every four years when there's an election when the like years of presidential elections i just think that would be great but um the reason i say that is because this gave me so much hope again uh, like hope and uh positivity toward the future of the of the country because these these girls in this documentary are very passionate about it and what i found so compelling and interesting about that is that they are very focused on their like their experience and in, in in like their their role within the country and and in within government their potential futures with the with the uh, government and like one one of the one of the girls says like yeah and you know my intention is I'm in twenty twenty in twenty forty I'm gonna run for president and I like I do like and I had the same thought with with boy state uh, in 2020, but I thought like, man, it would be so interesting if like in, you know, in a few, in a couple of decades, we get like, we like one of someone in one of these documentaries runs for president or has like a, a big political career. I just think that would be really interesting to see. But anyway, um, this, this is not, I would say that this documentary is about even with boy state. And there are some aspects of it that really elevate it above boy state um in particular and i don't think i can really spoil a documentary but this is this isn't really a spoiler but what i found so interesting about this was that the week that this takes place that they did their their filming they did the girl state thing like it's a big it's a big thing uh two things two things occurred uh around this time this was june 2022 uh, one is that this was the Missouri girl state thing that's yearly done yearly. Um, it was the first year that the girl state and boys state of like Missouri boys state and girl state took place at the same time on the same campus. So there are some moments here and there where the girls like run into the boys and, and there, there's a lot of conversation about like the differences between boy state and girl state. Um, which I found pretty interesting because it paints a very clear picture of, uh, of, you know, what, like the boy state getting a lot, uh, being a lot bigger than girl state and like having a lot more advantages and, uh, privilege and everything, um, than the girl's version of it was. Um, so that highlight was really interesting, especially when it comes to, uh, kind of comes to a head with one of the, one of the girls kind of taking up the mantle of like, expo- not exposing it, but like basically d- trying to do something about that. Like that, dis- that, um, discrepancy or the, 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 the difference between girl state and boy state. Um, that's one thing that I found interesting. The other thing that I found fascinating and i think puts it into such a unique and interesting perspective is that like i said this takes place this was filmed during like early june 2022 this happened in the uh in the between time between the uh, supreme court leaking the notes about wanting to overturn roe v wade and just before the Supreme court overturned Roe v. Wade. So throughout the documentary, you have like these, all all of the, like the 500 girls in this, in this thing that have the potential overturning of Roe v. Wade at the forefront of their minds. And it comes up and it, they're talking, they talk about it. There's a lot of obviously differing opinions, um, because like they, also, like they say, like, you know, I'm more conservative leaning or I'm more liberal leaning. And there's a lot of like debate and conversation surrounding it, um, surrounding that topic and everything, which I also, as an aside, I think it was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> it was kind of funny to me that uh, from what I remember of Boy State, I remember the the boys being a little bit more clear and confident about their political leanings, whether it was conservative or liberal. And I found it interesting and a little fascinating that in 2022, um, (laughs) because that was in 2019, 
Uh, but in 2022, um, when they were filming this, like there was a lot of like one of the one of the girls is like, well, I don't I, I mean, I don't really want to like like she's very she's very much trying to figure out how she can basically tell people that she's conservative without them not listening to her or them shutting down. And I thought that was, it was, there was a really funny, uh, line where, uh, she said something like, I feel like a lot of these girls are probably like a little like leaning on, uh, liberal side of things. And like, she says, like, I just feel like I can kind of tell cause the liberal girls are louder. Um, and I thought, I thought that was kind of funny as a, as a liberal dude myself, I thought that was pretty funny, but anyway, um, so the positioning of the documentary, uh, just by happenstance taking place shortly after, um, the leak that Roe v. Wade was, was potentially going to be overturned, uh, and the lead up to actually being overturned that puts it in this pocket of time that I found pretty fascinating to watch unfold, especially with it being the, the subject of the documentary being 500 girls who are passionate about politics and government and they're kind of dealing with that, uh, the potential of, of that big legislation happening, um, and the kind of the good and bad of that, depending on their personal beliefs and everything. Um, they're kind of debating that and they're figuring that out at, in real time. And I thought that was a really interesting way, uh, or an interesting thing that's captured in this documentary. Um, I will say that I, I felt like, I felt, I feel like it's, it's probably an, it's an interesting, it's an interesting experiment because I came away from this documentary ultimately thinking that like, well, you know, I, I remember Boy State being a lot more contentious. Like I remember like the big, like governor, um, uh, campaign was, it came down to like these two, these two guys, these two boys in boy state. And it was a big, big contentious campaign. And there was a lot, a lot going on. Girl state follows the same trajectory, follows the same structure because it's the same program. Um, but it's not that contentious. It's <laughs> like, I felt like, I feel like that maybe is a statement on the world that like, you know, boy state is more like, Oh, cutthroat and everything. And girl states just like, we're just trying to be, we're just trying to have our voice in, in government. Like we're trying to not be pigeonholed or we're trying not to be, uh, silenced or, you know, have our like rights stripped away by men. Like we're just trying to work together to, to have a voice in government. And I, I think that that's awesome. I thought that that was a kind of an interesting and, um, an interesting kind of not inverse, but an interesting change or difference between boy state and girl state. So I did appreciate that. And I did like that, but, um, at the risk of just sounding like an idiot, you know, movie goer person, I wanted it to be a little more exciting though. <laughs> so like I, it's kind of a mixed bag there. Um, I do think that the, um, the kind of late, uh, later in the documentary, like after, um, there, there's kind of like an, an addendum to it, not an addendum, not an addendum, but like kind of a, a postscript to, to it where like one of the, like I alluded to earlier, one of the girls is working on kind of exposing the differences between boy state and girl state that she's writing this article. And that takes up a lot of time late in the documentary. And I really liked that. I thought that that was like, I wish that there was a little bit more of that because she, she like, she's a very interesting uh, girl in the documentary. She's a very interesting subject uh, because she has a passion for uh, journalism, uh, but also a drive to want to be president and, and like want to succeed at girl state. And the, the track that she follows throughout the documentary is really, is really interesting and captivating because uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't go certain ways that she expected or you, or we, the viewer expected, but I really liked seeing that particular girl, like kind of just like take, take the reins on something and, and, and run with it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It was, it was really compelling. I just wish that there was a little bit more of that aspect of it, the, uh, differences between boy state and girl state, but also 
that is also a kind of a double-edged sword because I think that uh, there was a risk of the documentary taking a little bit too much um, time, devoting too much time to like showing boy state and com- like how it compares to girl state, which I understand the documentary needed to do that because of that uh, kind of final um, run at the end of it uh, with, with that one, the one girl like going after kind of the differences between them. But also throughout the movie, like or throughout the documentary, like it cuts to like a couple of scenes at, at boy state and them running into him. Like, I already watched Boy State. Like, like obviously it's not the same one because it's years later and that's a different state. But I'm like, I've already seen the documentary about Boy State. I don't care to see these teenage boys doing their government thing. I want to see how the girls do over here. Like, that's just, that's, it felt a little bit like, I don't know. It, it just felt a little bit, uh, a little bit annoying there uh, for me. But it was, it was in service to like, like they found the plot, they found the plot there and they found a reason to, to depict some of the stuff from boy state, because there is some very clear differences, um, between them. And it's, it's a really interesting kind of depiction of kind of a bigger problem within government, kind of the, the microcosm of a bigger problem within government. So, um, yeah, so that is uh, about all I've got for <laughs> girl state. Like I said, it is streaming on Apple TV plus. Um, I ended up rating it four stars on letterboxd. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed boy state. And once again, I really think that like, I think that anyone who has a, a, a vague interest in politics or even want to, uh, know more, I guess, about politics, I, I guess, I don't know, anyone who's jaded, anyone who's cynical about the state of politics in the U.S. should watch these two documentaries to get a little bit of a boost of hope uh, from uh, hope toward the future. And I think that I think that that also kind of stems from the fact that these are kids who are teenagers, who have a passion for government. None of them are like influencers or celebrities or, uh, they're not, uh, they're not, uh, real estate tycoons who get bankrupt all the time, or they're not reality show hosts. They're not old ass people. (laughs) Like they're not, they are kids who have a passion for government. And that is, that is what kind of makes me happy to see because they're not, they're not con artists. They're not people who are trying to game the system. They have an active interest in government. And that's what I want to see. And that's, I think that that's what it comes down to is that I just don't, I don't want stupid performative, uh, candidates or anything, or I don't know. It's all, it's all, who cares? It's just the, the, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's, that's also funny. Um, like I, as an aside, and I'll wrap up here in a second, but as an aside, um, so uh, some friends of mine and I were talking about the rock and like, uh, I think, I guess WrestleMania was, was going on, um, like a week or so ago. And some, some of the guys that I, I talked to, they were saying that, um, like they were positing that like, Oh yeah, the rock went back to, to WrestleMania because his, uh, because his acting career is faltering. Um, and he is like the, the idea is that he's maybe soft launching a presidential run in 2028. Um, and like, I was particularly proud of this and it, I also kind of think this a little bit, but like, uh, my thought was the idea of the rock D- Dwayne Johnson soft launching a run for president, uh, makes me a little bit more eager to see Alex Garland's civil war this week, uh, because I, I'll be able to escape into a reality where the U S is done Um, (laughs) because I don't want that to be a thing. Like I don't want, I don't want celebrities in politics. Hard stop. Anyway, that is my review of uh, Girl State. Once again, it is on uh, Apple TV Plus. I highly recommend watching Boy State and Girl State um, because they are very interesting, engaging documentaries. Um, I'm not going to do a potpourri section for this week, but I will say uh, thank you to everyone who joined in on the live stream. 
Um, and I've, I've seen like the count go up and down and everything. So I don't know. But anyway, um, I had it set up to where only subscribers can comment on it. So Paige commented once and no one else commented. So I don't know if just people just didn't want to subscribe. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Check out Obsessive Viewer Podcasts on YouTube. I have a bunch of stuff on there and I'm trying to kind of grow that channel a little bit uh, to also funnel into more podcast listeners. So um, that will do it for this week's episode of the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. As always, thank you so much for listening and make sure to follow the show on social media and subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast app. Also, uh, check out Obsessive Viewer Podcast's other shows, including Tower Junkies, a Stephen King podcast hosted by Tiny and myself, and Anthology, the Twilight Zone and classic sci-fi podcast hosted by me. Uh, uh, Anthology has an episode coming out this week with my friend Victor Gamboa of the Outer Limits podcast. Had a lot of fun chatting with Victor um, about both the Twilight Zone and the Outer Limits. So check that out on Anthology on Friday. Um, Next week on The Obsessive Viewer, we are going to have a big show. Uh, Episode 424, I'm going to be reviewing Civil War with a new guest. Uh, I, I won't reveal who it is, but uh, a new guest to the podcast. I'm very excited to chat with him about that. And the secondary review will be for Late Night with the Devil, which I've already recorded with Mike. So it's going to be a good show. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you next week. And now, enjoy this short clip from a recent Patreon-exclusive episode. For the full episode and more Patreon-exclusive content, sign up at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. David Cronenberg is a filmmaker that I am very, uh, not unfamiliar with, but I kind of tend to avoid his work because he has a reputation in my mind as being someone who is a little bit a little bit outside of my comfort zone in terms of body horror and, and visual effects. And obviously scanners has a very famous scene where a person's head explodes, like legitimately explodes, um, in the movie. And I will say that it is a pretty awesome sequence. Um, but it is incredibly brief too. It is brief and it is kind of not, uh, it, it it's kind of not consequential consequential to it's not of a certain consequence to the movie basically it's kind of an inciting incident rather so um i don't know but anyway uh i really am not sure if i liked scanners (laughs) thank you for listening to the obsessive viewer podcast This episode was produced and edited by me, Matt Hurt. If you have feedback, thoughts on our episodes, or just want to connect, you can email me at matt at obsessiveviewer.com. For more information on this show, including a full archive of our episodes and show notes, visit obsessiveviewer.com. And if you enjoyed the show, please give us a follow on social media and subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice so you never miss an episode. Also, consider rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Audible to help increase our visibility and grow our community. If you want to support the show and get early access to new episodes, as well as a steady stream of exclusive episodes, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. For information on more podcasts presented by obsessiveviewer.com, visit obsessiveviewer.com slash podcasts. Our theme song is A Little Mad Sometimes by As Good As It Gets. For more of their music, check them out on Spotify and at asgoodasitgetsmusic.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. See this episode's show notes for our unique promo code to get up to two months of free podcasting service with Libsyn when you sign up for a new account. Get your show on Apple and Spotify. Get helpful stats and all the support you need to sound your very best.